Shovel, an arts and music podcast. Today I speak with musician and record label co-founder Ryan Durr. Enjoy. How's it going? Good. I think we sound okay. I'm um, outside because it was too loud to be inside. Gotcha. Let me find like a good stationary spot. Let Are your see. children just going off right now? Oh yeah. I mean, everybody's like just waking up and and uh, normal everyday circus inside, you know, and. Uh, we are going to keep, we're debating whether or not to keep Arya Mia um, home from daycare this week. And then we check, the, we can check online how many kids are infected with what at the school. And there's like a whole bunch of shit going around. So we're like, okay, let's just keep everybody home so everybody's not sick for the whole winter vacation and stuff. But it's, uh, it's busier at home. In, gotcha, gotcha. In that instance. <laughs> And uh, we both, Sucker and I both still work from home, which is pretty nice. But she's working like full time. Today I'm like part time. Tomorrow I'm full time. It's like kind of always juggling when everybody's home. But what are you doing for work? I've been working for the same uh, ad agency for like th- almost four years now, um, mainly as a copywriter. But I'm just in like the creative planning department so i get asked to do like random stuff and like uh two months ago i went down to do some voiceover work for like a um nikon spot uh like kind of they have this thing called nps which Mm -hmm. is like a support group uh if you're like gear breaks when you're like out on assignment so i was doing like narration uh for this kind of info video on that and then other times just asked to do research or like tagline kind of development and stuff and interesting done some music for videos and stuff so it's pretty fun that it's like all different stuff yeah varied work yeah yeah so when did you move to japan how long ago was that that was uh sorry let me get to another quieter spot first in 2005 uh to kyoto and then we were back in the U.S. and then back over here in Yokohama and then back to the U.S. again and then in Tokyo now since 2015. So okay. we've been, been here for eight years in the same spot, which has been really good. And like you say, like this particular area has some kind of energy. And uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, underground currents and electromagnetic kind or something else but <laughs> like very productive and like very centered around here so and I'm you first to... ended up there because you were teaching english is that correct i got a job um right out of college kind of and teaching and i didn't really think it was going to be more than one year and then i left you know when the year was done um but then after being in New York for a couple of years, we're kind of like, oh, maybe we left a good thing kind of too soon and wanted to come back and see how else, you know, how, how things would go. And then uh, kind of just like worked with lifestyles and kind of, I don't know, it's uh, some easy to pinpoint things and other things not so easy to to explain away i guess why we decided to make more of like a permanent move over here later on gotcha and you started discotopia 
How long ago? That was actually Matt Line, okay. who is a, t- a taught line. And he moved to Japan kind of at the same time that I did. I think either the same year or a year earlier or so. And he was in Osaka. And I was in Kyoto, which is really close. But we didn't know each other at the time. And then he started Discotopia with his wife um, as an events kind of thing. And they were just doing parties and, and things like that uh, in Osaka. And then Matt and I met in 2009, 2010 in, in Tokyo uh, through mutual friends. And then he's kind of, you know, kind of floated the idea. He wanted to develop it more into a label. And would I be interested? And timing was really good. And I was kind of working with some other guys, um, you know, from Philly. But then me being in Japan and they, I think musically we were kind of like going in different directions at that time anyway so it kind of worked out like in in several different kind of layers uh to get the label going so then we we launched the label in 2011 and it's still going to this day which i'm very very thankful for can you explain those differences in direction i only ask because you know it's a label for electronic music right yeah and electronic music is so broad that I'm not even sure if I understand what it means outside of it was made uh, non-traditionally. Is that what's the best way to explain that? I mean, I think I think as far as just with who I was working with prior, and I mean, I wasn't really directly involved um, with the label from Philly Sclusiasis, like in the kind of big overarching kind of decisions or anything. I was kind of just an artist mm-hmm. with the label. Um, but just style stylistically, I guess. And then just being more being that, that far geographically removed, you're kind of like, you know, not doing club nights together or like events and stuff. And it's, you know, get to just go and meet up and discuss things in person, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, you, it, it's, it's easy to drift that way, you know? And then I think for Matt and I, we were kind of both when we, when we met, we became fast friends and kind of realized we liked a lot of the same things growing up, but also had a lot of very different interests too, Mm -hmm. uh, musically, I'm I'm saying. So we kind of were like sharing things. Oh, I never really dug into this so much. And I'll check this out and, you know, sharing influences and and stuff like that. So we both knew that we liked like a broad range of music and wanted to incorporate kind of, elements of everything in very subliminal ways into hopefully something that no one's heard before or you know that at least it was exciting to us Mm -hmm. so i think that was the basis kind of where we were still when we were starting discotopia we weren't saying like right this is like a you know uk i mean it what we at the time we were very i i think um adjacent to what was going on in this kind of like post dubstep uk funky you know kind of still this other resurgence third or fourth wave of grime kind of thing and a lot of these things kind of melding together at that 2000 early 2010s time and we definitely had a foot in that pond Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. at the same time we didn't want to anchor it to anything and we always and to this day we're not you know so one one release could sound completely different from one to the next but there's still some kind of thread that if you listen or were really kind of paying attention to the, the tone of what it, what it was and not so much the actual sonic language, um, there was a connection there. And I think that we've kind of fostered that still to this day. And um, Could you describe that thread? No. <laughs> no. Does that it's make hard. it difficult <laughs> to to pitch or sell some does it make it Yes. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think it does. But I think I think what we sacrifice maybe uh commercially in that sense we make up for uh artistically, I think in the long run where we can still look back and be proud of what we put out as a catalog, you know. And mm-hmm. I think that uh it's too easy I, to me it's and I think Matt would say the same thing that it's it's very just uninspired and boring explained away on a 
uh, on a on a press release you know where like yeah. we, we we like to have fun with the press releases and make it like almost short works of prose <laughs> and it's kind mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. you know if you read it without any context you could just what are these guys what are these guys on what are they talking about but it's more fun that way and then you know if you actually if anyone cares enough and you actually have the time to sit down and listen to it you know you can kind of pick up on it it's more of like um how you explain uh you know one painting to like a photograph you know like some some kind of like a photo that gives you a lot of feelings and hits some kind of nerve and then like a, a painting at the same thing well how do you describe the difference between the two it's like you can describe your own uh reaction to it your own your own kind of uh take on it but i don't know if it's something universally that can be kind of pinned down um yeah it's just that, it's difficult in respect to marketing but i i mm -hmm. relate to what you're saying yeah um but the world demands at least the commercial world demands a kind of low resolution explanation so that people can grasp onto it who are on yeah. the outside of the thing which you know i understand the there's something cool about that i never quite learned that skill i'm, I'm working on it but mm. um you know the elevator pitch of discotopia for even for a listener right like how would you I'm sure you have to explain it all the time. Yeah. Is, is there I mean, uh, is there something you've landed on? I mean, we we kind of go with um you know uh non-linear uh genreless take on modern quote-unquote electronic music, I guess. So it's it's still quite vague, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. but what what we're really doing is is trying to present uh, a worldview, both kind of based in reality and imagined, uh, into kind of this narrative that we've been building over the past 12 years, um, you know, with not only our own music, but with people from Japan or from Portugal or from the UK or America, you know, so we're working with people all over the world that we somehow find either they get in touch with us or we find that it, it's always interesting and different how, how these kind of collaborations work too. But there's something there where there's just this kind of a bit skewed, you know, it's a bit mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. It's, it's maybe you can kind of pinpoint a bit here where this is, this was the, the, the starting point on the map and we've kind of gone way off the, the edge here, you know, and, and it's like in this other territory where you can, you can, if you listen and really kind of pick out certain things, you can you can find the, the relative frequencies, but we're trying to operate at some different levels there. And, you know, it, again, in the press releases, maybe it might go a little wonky uh, with some of the stuff, but we, we drop in little, little uh, hints and clues in there as to, to where some of the kind of vibes are coming from where where the influences are coming from you know or at least mm -hmm. where they started on from um and i think what's fun too is that we for matt and myself we've kind of been in such close contact where we talk we talk like almost every day i think you know because we're friends from the beginning anyway and then we're doing the label out of love and continue it we're lucky that we're able to continue it this long with that we you know, just kept at it, you know, and didn't want to stop it and found ways to keep it going. And it's just, uh, been lucky that it's, it's been able to be self-sustaining for this long. So know, does it, is, does it sustain itself financially or do you have to work your other jobs? Does. It does. That's no, I, it does. Yeah. I mean, we, we can kind of, we might need to take a break for, for a mm -hmm. couple months to let, let, uh, the, the self-sustaining kind of, catch up in a crew so we can have funds to, to do the next project, but, but it does on its own, which is awesome, nice. you know, and then depend, depending on the project too, with certain people, they might want to do something a little more extravagant as far as uh, physical media. And then, uh, just the state of what the industry is now and uh, pressing costs and everything is insane. So 
um, that might be a different case where the artists themselves will will put up some money for the pressings and stuff like that. And, you know, that that's kind of dependent um, on the project and, and on the artists that we're working with. But, where where uh, do you find most of your support comes from? Is it Japan? Is it Europe? Is it America? I think it, depending, it's kind of diff- What's interesting too is like it depends on the release. Uh, but overall, I think the biggest market that we we see a response from is kind of in order, maybe like U.S., U.K., Japan, mm-hmm. and then varying other countries, kind of depending on the release. Um, so that's interesting too. I was, I was, I've, I kind of, I kind of avoided looking at the analytics of things and and um, some of the the real like those you could see, you know, the gender and age and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know, who's listening. And I, I don't know. I, I, I like the, the mystique that comes, even being in this position, uh, the mystique is kind of, it's better not to know. And then to just so you don't let any bit of pandering or kind of, uh, consideration for, for the audience get into any kind of your decision-making. Uh, because then I think that's where you start to go askew, you know? And then if you start letting some of those, even if you, you don't really care or you're not trying to let it influence any of your, your choices, it, it kind of does, you know, it'll just somehow find its way through your brain into, to make you maybe think about things or act upon like those, those artistic choices in a different way. And, um, yeah, I'd rather just not know <laughs> unless, mm-hmm. unless we're like, you know, uh, ex- directly contacted or kind of made aware of, of who's really enjoying or supporting and things like that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's obviously changed over time too, since 2011, I think who, who's listening and who's still into music at all. You know, like we get some, uh, emails back. We'll, when we have a new release coming out and we send promo for radio and press and, you know, DJs and other other producers and people we know or whatever. Over the years, some people have gotten back to us saying, "Please don't send me this music anymore. I'm not I'm not doing it anymore. You know, I've, I've given it up," which is <laughs> shocking to me. Um, but it's that's what happens, I guess. You know. Do you um, think there's any relevance or impact of it being based in Japan? Meaning, if, could it be based in America and have the same results, or is there a regional? aspect and influence there i mean i'd like to say that there's not but i I, there probably is in the sense that there's the exoticism along with being a quote-unquote like japanese label even Mm -hmm. though we're not japanese and i i don't like to play into that or even like mention it at all because i don't think it matters where geographically we're located it just happens to be here we just happen to have our lives here and you know wanted to start a label and everything else. Um, I think some people can play up those kind of cultural points more and rightfully so. Uh, I don't want to be in any kind of space where it seems like any kind of appropriation or like, uh, you know, clout chasing or anything. I, I, I don't think it matters. And I, I personally don't care at all, you know, about any of that. I think that, whatever the that you're putting out should speak for itself regardless where it's from or who made it you know um but i i would assume that there's some truth to that (laughs) to 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 what you said and maybe for some things catching on or not or not catching on too um but it seems you know these days it's kind of like everything is so decentralized and and globalized for for the better or for the worse uh, it's it's kind of unavoidable to, I mean, you need, as you're saying about the you know pitches for for audiences and kind of just the quick rundown kind of nitty gritty. It's like you you need some kind of cultural markers or some kind of keywords to stand out in in people's minds since there's such a vast amount of yeah yeah in, in terms of music. You know, every single day, just so much is you know right now there's how many releases just came out um so that makes sense and especially for people who are just starting out and like new artists trying to 
get their name out or, or labels get, getting some kind of recognition, you need something. Um, so I'm not trying to judge anybody, but from my, from my standpoint, I don't like to kind of play that up at all because I don't think it's important. I don't think that it's, it, it should be even a, a footnote. So you don't put much pressure on it in the sense of, well, how do you know when it's succeeding and when it's failing the, the whole endeavor? And do you have a sense of where you want it to go or how long you want it to last? I think we'd like it to go as long as we have the passion for it. And then as soon as we both start feeling like it's a chore or we're not confident in the material that's being put out would be a time to stop, you know, and I don't think we're like anywhere near that point. Um, and you both put out work on the label, correct? We do. Yeah. Yeah. And we try not to make it just only our work, but at, at the same time, it's kind of become harder to, I don't know, maybe find some of the, collaborate other collaborators that that are on that same kind of thread mm. that we've been been building that i mentioned and uh we'll go you know it's it's very it's it's interesting how it works out just like we'll get kind of cold call emails from people we've never met before um and the music will be incredible and like perfectly just like this is exactly what i was hoping we would release one day and it just ends up in my inbox in the morning, you know, and that's happened a couple times. And I, I don't really know how to uh, explain that, you know, where it just kind of the timing and different people's decisions worked out at the same time that they thought, hey, let's contact these guys with this music right now, where it was kind of fit perfectly into where we were going on the trajectory of the label as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has been awesome. Um, two, two such cases of that was when we did the first um, Seekers International release, which is the Raga Preservation Society album. And Seekers are a crew in, in, um, from, from the Philippines based in Vancouver and make this incredible kind of very dub and sound system inspired kind of deconstructed jungle and like roots and, and lovers rock, but, and like dance hall and in, in this very original kind of crazy way that I, I can't fully explain. And we're able to do a project, two projects with, with them, which is incredible. And we're still good friends with, with all of them and the very, very, very nice people. And then also a band called Among from berlin uh which is one one guy from brazil and a young woman from uh beijing and they kind of just hit us up out of nowhere with an album full, fully done basically that was perfect you know we mm -hmm, were just mm -hmm. kind of floored by it. it was like wow how did this happen <laughs> you know um so as long as those those kind of nice coincidences and, and our own kind of um, excitement and you know we're, we're still feeling like we're progressing ourselves and uh, you know individually I think that we wouldn't really want to stop at any point uh, and other life reasons why if anything else massive got in the way that forced us to stop we wouldn't um, and then just as far as Goal, long-term goals, I think, would be just to continue, you know, and just see where everything goes. I think that we've we've never really tried to outstretch or like, uh, what should I say, over overstretch where where we were, um, and the kind of landscape has changed a lot too. I think. I think in the you know a few years ago, we were kind of hope for coverage here with the you know there's not really any like online magazines left i don't know maybe a lot of people don't even know that there were some <laughs> yeah, yeah. years ago um you know but the and even blogs you know and like that was a really big thing for a long time i don't know why that kind of stopped too and maybe like substack and people doing those those you know kind of um 
it's essentially a blog now, right? I mean, they're, they're like I newsletters. I think so. I think that's you know that yeah. It might it might be like a resurgence, which I hope because I think it's great for culture and for I I found so much incredible music through you know so many great blogs back in you know a couple years ago, ten years ago, or something like that. A little more than that, and they all just went down and then i I know there's reasons for that multitude of of reasons but you as far as that kind of like just ground support um is is really important and helpful uh and we don't often like pay for pr uh so any any coverage that we've got has been just based on people actually really liking what the project was and wanting to cover it um which was funny like we were doing a, a red bull uh, not it wasn't Red Bull official, but we were doing a radio show at the Red Bull studio in Shibuya here for a couple of years um, in 2016 or 15 to 2017. And uh, one of the main guys who were work, was working at the studio kind of we had a release at the time and was had some coverage, I think, on Fact magazine, which is still going, I guess. I, they they, they kind of changed the format. Um and so he just assumed, he's like, oh, how much did that cost? And we're like, nothing. We never, we didn't pay for it. He's like, really? really? You know, he just assumed that that's how it got there. That's, that's how we got covers is because we paid for it. But that's not the case. And I, it, it is the case for, for a lot of things in music industry now. Sure, but sure, sure. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have the funds to do it number one and then i think we also like don't feel very good about it where it just feels disingenuous and very thin while there's so much uh you know there's integrity lacking from from the get-go in, in music and industry from since forever you know we want to at least save some when we can <laughs> right but you know um and can you speak to how many releases do you personally have on Discotopia? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I have to go back and check. Quite I mean, at least like it looks like four, ten, 14. Is that about? Oh, maybe, maybe I, twelve. Maybe, twelve, and then you're maybe, fe- you're featured on two. Is what I'm seeing on the yeah, website. Yeah, thanks. There, there's a couple <laughs> under Mayaka as well, which is which is an alias which I haven't used for a while. So there's two Mayaka EPs. Okay. Which uh, and. And then Matt has a few aliases as well, numerous, numerous more than, than I do. Apart from being half of Green Lines, he's Green Lines with uh, Chris Greenberg, who's who lives in UK and Cambridge. Um, so yeah, we make up a fair amount, I think, of our Matt and I's material makes up a fair amount of the actual catalog. Um, but I think it helps kind of sustain and keep the direction going as, as it kind of sure, shifts sure. and turns. Uh, and then we kind of help set these kind of signposts, but at the same time, it doesn't need to follow that at all, you know? So, um, it can, and we want it to be deviating and kind of bending and turning and stuff. So it's, it's not very, you know, one note or kind of, uh, you can't really expect what the next thing is going to sound like. So can you explain, what, like, to an individual listening to this, what your music would maybe mm-hmm. sound like if you gave them? Um, what would you say? Some, I guess at at this point, uh, I'm kind of coming from a little more of like a free. <laughs> let me let me start over. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm definitely like. Just not cons- I think when I was making music ten plus years ago, I was more involved with playing out in clubs and kind of the club side of music as well. So that was influencing what I was making. Where personally, I was making things that I would want to be DJing out at the time, and the kind of music that I'd like to hear in that kind of a setting, pl- mixed with all the other influences that I've had through my life and kind of where it could kind of work in a club setting or in the headphone or like listening at home. Kind of were thing. you DJing in Japan? Yeah. 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 We were doing like a few regular events, you know, a few years ago and then kind of less as time went on as families and work and things, you know, went on. And then, uh, Matt is DJing a bit more 
recently and i i've not uh done much which i'm totally fine with i'm not really trying to um but i think from a few years ago i kind of stopped i really I, i think i made a really conscious effort not to um to turn off that switch in my mind kind of like that this okay this needs to have all of these elements let's go down the list of you know uh a kick drum with a compressor on it or like you know a sub bass on here because so it'll sound good in a club and xx mm-hmm. and then i was just kind of making music with no preconceived notions and i was really trying to just like in that moment what am i trying to fe- and channel something to feel and then just kind of build build it out from there and i think a lot of my music has just always been very influenced from you know dub reggae and you know elements of drum and bass and then also industrial music and punk and whatever you know um and i think i've just gotten better in the last few years of kind of uh narrowing down really what it was i wanted to hear and not just making something and finishing it because i i think it's it's easy it to to just put get any kind of idea down um and then it's hard to build it out and finish it uh sure. i've i've gotten better at getting ideas down and then erasing it and starting again where i i think in the past i was always like okay well i've started this thread so i got to I got to continue it because it's this sounds like something so it could be something now but when I'm starting things now it's like well this is something but I don't like it so let me start something else and then get it to something that I do like if that makes any sense and it does it does yeah you yeah. know and yeah I think just but as far as the sound <laughs> to go back to the original question I think there's I try to get like a lot of kind of definitely percussive feeling and I always I like like kind of the feel of like polyrhythms in music and and uh something that kind of like anchors into you know like a bass kind of weight and from just you know love of drum and bass and jungle and then and like early dubstep and that kind of stuff um and then I don't know just jazz i mean there's like so so many different and it's it's different on each day too you know um but i it it's not easy to describe maybe other people might be better at it than i am but i just uh well yeah like yeah, yeah it know, makes I sense like to it. me now that the regional aspect is less important since you don't dj as much cuz i assume djing in a club at least has a little more regionality cuz it's people coming out in that local spot. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't traffic in any of, yeah, I don't even know if I've ever been to a, well, I've been to some clubs, but not much and just not my world, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it changes so quick too. And just, um, there's less and less, I think like pockets of regional scenes and obviously like back pre internet days, that's how, there's like DC hardcore, or like New York hard, right, different. Right. They all had like their own kind of vibe, you know, with whatever genre of music you want to pick, you know, um, and then just it that doesn't exist anymore for a long time. Where if there's like a new kind of sound or a take on something or some mutation of of this style or that style, it's it's immediately kind of globally consumed and picked up and it just kind of goes from barely an idea or like a, an inkling of something into being kind of consumed into the zeitgeist where before there was other time for things to kind of gestate and and get its own kind of culture or yeah style and dance or whatever you know whatever um and that's just the nature of that there's it's no use in kind of complaining about it but it's like uh yeah, it, it it's interesting how just the there's there's less there's less mystery, I think, in music and art these days, which is really sad. And I really liked when I was young, like the the mystique of 
not knowing who made this record or what they look like or, you know, uh, where yeah, did this yeah. come from? This, this sounds like it's from another planet, you know, and, it, and maybe it was, and <laughs> you know, and now it, it's too easy to kind of have the veil lifted and yeah the, the access the, the access is too readily available and there's no real initiation into a scene or mm -hmm. or an understanding of the subtler language of of something it's just mm -hmm. uh it's really skipping across the surface of each thing often and I, yeah go ahead no i agree and you know in any kind of medium i think if there's a way to kind of pull the veil back down again on things is important for a next kind of step forward by going backward. Uh, if that's even possible at all. And I'm not uh, trying to be like, um, totally blanket over my eyes and, you know, hands over my ears in regards to like AI. Uh, but, <laughs> Yep. There's, it's, you know, it's, it's a big hot mess of, yep. <laughs> of, yeah. for, for so many industries and so many people. Um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how the like antithesis of any kinds of those AI like assisted artworks or, or pure AI created content, um, how that pops up you know and yeah it's gonna be that, wild i think so yeah. I've, it's uh, and it's gonna happen it has to happen soon right yeah i mean yeah soon in this in this world of speed in respect to ai i think it's like in five years you're gonna see a massive shift in a lot of things and you'll probably see an explosion in the cost of physical art made by actual people yeah, which is already very expensive and mm -hmm. something I think about a lot like maybe the next comic I make is just there's only one that exists of it, you know. Yeah. I think the it's a shame cuz I love rep reproducible objects that are accessible to everyone, mm -hmm. but I'm beginning to think that oversaturation won't even allow for people to appreciate that aspect and you might I don't know. There's just going to be a growing exclusivity to, I hope, like physical activity, like secret things, like you're saying. Yeah. The, the reemergence of mystery. Of course, with that comes gatekeeping and, well, yeah, that's the, by definition, right? Like initiation is, is hierarchical and you're kind of left out of it until you're not. And mm -hmm. I, as much as I can understand why some people don't like that, that's precisely why it has importance or is sacred often because mm -hmm. you can't just, you know, click on a website and access the thing or, you know, my hope is that I always thought that the infinite access of the internet, everyone would kind of have a homogenous taste and understand the precious hidden things. But, mm -hmm. but I think there might be tiers to taste in which, um, no matter what, no matter how much access there exists, there will be a different ratio of individuals who can see a little bit ahead and they're interested in that obscure thing, uh, in like a metaphysical sense. And, mm -hmm. and most people will just walk right past it. And I mean that metaphorically on the internet, like it wouldn't even click. So yeah. I think I think no matter what, as we've seen with access, there will always be tastemakers and middlemen and there might even be an increase because of the absolute like chaos of choice. Um I think people are gonna get exhausted and just be like, you just choose what's good art for me and I'll buy it, which already happens, you know? Oh yeah. 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 That curation is, has, I mean, there's an industry of, of curators already. Right. And there has been for a long time, but I, I fully agree with what you said and, and very, you know, emphatically kind of am, am behind it. And in that people need to have the initiative to the initiation, uh, you know, you need to make some effort and it's the same thing with people, the kind of vinyl resurgence in the past coming year, 
the past few years, you know, past a yeah, yeah. couple of years, um, which sounds good on paper, but it's actually all just like, uh, you know, Taylor Swift records being pressed, then it's clogging up pressing plants, and then it's making times and prices for independent labels and artists go through the roof, and people's, yeah. you know, plans be totally out the window because of these, like, big label, billion-dollar selling artists take up... So all this space for for the action and you know that's a whole other whole other it's, thing. It's like but. a monkey paw shit. Like you got to be careful yeah. what you wish for because exactly you never know. And that's where I try to you know I was talking about AI with my wife today, and I've got to remain humble about humanity's ability to control certain things. I don't know how the the net negative or net positive of it existing and what it's going to do to art. Um, but I do know that it's concerning from a certain perspective. I just, I don't know. Like, I just don't think there's high aesthetic literacy in general, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on, it totally depends on the culture. Um, and when you're just increasing the amount of, of shit, I think it. I think it makes even a, a bigger problem in that. In that sense, yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. And the temptation and I, is to reduce it down, like 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 uh, to an elevator pitch, which is interesting. That, mm -hmm. and I understand why you're unwilling to do so. I think that's a good thing, uh, but that reduction is largely a sacrifice for a more commercially viable product. But it sounds like that's not the mm. priority. Uh, it's more of a thing that grows with you as you grow in life. Yes. Yeah, and and I think in in our path, and for me personally, just uh, artistically, it's 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 become. And I think I've learned myself more in the past few years, especially. It's kind of uh, a therapy, and it's meditation, and it's kind of hopefully some kind of growth spiritually, and and. and I, I hope, uh, you know, um, mentally, <laughs> I don't know if that's totally true, but it's, 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 it's supposed to make you reflect on yourself first. Right. And I, there's different reasons for people making music and, and making art, making film, whatever. Um, but I really believe that you need to be making something that you're proud of yourself first before even considering releasing it out into the world, you know, and yeah. any type of pandering or kind of trying to catch up and, and be part of something that's, that you, you know, I mean, it's, everyone has own the reason, own reasons for doing everything. And I'm not, I'm no one to judge about anyone's, you know, life choices, but I think just in terms of creative process and creative work, you need to be a hundred percent honest and you need to be happy with yourself first and what you're, what you're making that's reflective of yourself to kind of join into any kind of push of, of culture forward or kind of, you know, what, what is it that you're contributing in your time that you're here um, that you can hopefully look back on and be proud of. You know, and I think how do, you, how do you know when that's not self indulgent? Because I like John Frusciante a lot, and yeah, and um, I don't know if you've listened to well, first off, I find it very interesting that some of his albums seem, if I'm not mistaken, like often only come out in Japan, or at least like they only have a Japanese pressing. Oh, really? And, and it, the most insane shit he puts out that's like almost unlistenable. I don't uh -huh. know. It's very strange to me, but I think about him a lot as an artist who went to the top of uh -huh. certain of certain mode of making, and then also went very self indulgent. I'm not saying that's bad or good, and uh -huh. I think he had brilliant moments in both modes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a question I always ask myself when. When I make, because I've made some strange things that um, 
are almost I, incomprehensible. I love the strange things that you've made, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. But I, but I asked myself some questions later on. You know, like um, I don't know if it's a social concern. It's just more like I, I am pretty interested in how do I know when I'm growing and how do I know when I'm de- mm-hmm. de- 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 evolving. Yeah. But, but how do you do? You have an understanding of uh, I, that. Is that a problem? Yeah. Is self indulgence a problem in art making, or are you saying that's that barometer? Yeah, that's I, okay. I, I overall, I would say it's a good thing, uh, as long as you're not on some kind of like very negative, destructive path with it, where you're, uh, you know, it's it's detrimental to someone else's. Uh, well-being physical or mental well-being <laughs> if you're not like uh you know what if it's to your own detriment if it's to your own i maybe maybe that's part of your path then you okay. know and maybe it's meant it's meant to be that way for a bit for you to come out the other end and see the you know to to go through the one spectrum to come out to the to the other lighter, lighter side um but i i think for myself i just always think is this better than what was my best the last time and I never want to like put out anything that I don't personally feel was a progression or better in my own judgment to what I had done before for for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would and, say each album and your by your mysterious metrics at least are uh, yeah. they, they they continue to get better. I hope so. I I, I think so. Otherwise, I wouldn't uh, be confident enough to to say let's put this out into mm-hmm. the world. Yeah. And what's and the what's the process of? I don't know. How long does an album tend to take to make? Is there a is there um, kind of like a standard standardized process there or no? Recently, it's been about a year between projects. But this the past one that that um, we just put out in November, uh, Amaranthine was. I had a bunch of tracks that. I finished, but weren't included on the album, like another like 15 tracks or so. Mm. And then this didn't seem to fit in the kind of narrative that was kind of formed. I didn't really like have a, a set plan when I, when I was, I was just making, just following different threads and finishing them and then seeing how they all fit together in the end and ended up, you know, working into something I thought to be pretty coherent but then through that process too, I think in the past year, I realized that I wanted to kind of put an end uh, to putting music out as BD 1982 under that that name. Oh, really? Where I just kind of felt that where I had started with it um, and kind of the methods I was using to make music and in part influences, but I guess just more of like the overall sound and the, the outcome, the, the, the final product had kind of shifted so much uh, to what I was making and how I was making things now. And, and the, the, mm, I don't know, just the space where it was operating is, it was so far removed, um, that it, it felt like a good time to put a cap on it and then start something new going forward. So, um, yeah, this was the final BD 1982 album. And then, uh, going forward, I was going to be using trimmed limbs, which I hope makes some kind of new pathway into, uh, you know, just my, my, it, it, this is a selfish thing. You know, this, this is self-indulgent in, in this way, I guess. But, um, and it might be, again, not very commercially viable as maybe some people know BD 1982 music. And then this is a whole nother name and project that mm-hmm. is starting fresh from the ground up. But that's exciting, uh, personally. And then that's, I think, the way forward at this point where you have to be excited and intrigued by it yourself first to to kind of make anything that's going to be, you know, that you're going to be proud of going forward. Um, so you're operating largely from intuition, it sounds like. It's not like I, you're, you're ending BD because this, that, or the other thing happened in your life or because... Mm-hmm. It's just and and often with intuitive work, it's hard to talk about because, well, it exists in a different plane than yes. than rational thought. 
Although I do yes. find that that very mundane things often influence every process, intuitive or otherwise. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of curious. Something I ask a lot of artists on this podcast is how did having children impact your process and art making in general? I think it's in innumerable ways, to be honest. And yeah. uh, all, all of them have been overwhelmingly positive where, you know, a lot of people might say, and I hear a lot of people say like, oh, I don't have any time since having kids to work on this or work on that. And da, 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 I'm too exhausted at the end of the day. But you find energy and power in that exhaustion. And then in that lack of time, you find more time. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when the moment does arise and you do have, you know, a space and, and some time to, to get some ideas down, they've kind of been simmering and, and, and boiling for a while. So you're left with really just the core kind of clear idea of what it is that needs to get done at that moment. <laughs> so, uh, there was, when you have too much time, you're, you, it's very easy to flounder, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have that, that blank canvas and you just, where am I going? And you just feel, you know, it's very easy to get distracted with nothing by having too much time or too much of everything, you know, you just all these options at, at in front of you. And then when you feel like, okay, I have 20 minutes and there's this in front of me right now. Let's do it. You get something much more honest than raw. And then I think that has a, a weight to it that you can kind of, uh, when you come back to it later, you know, you can see clearly, a, a bit more clearly where the intent was. And then, um, yeah, I think with, as far as time management in that sense, that's been very beneficial. And I can't, firstly, I can't make uh, any music if I don't feel good and I don't feel kind of like I'm not stressed or worried. So a lot of people can kind of be very angry and have something very, you know, mm -hmm. infuriating happen during the day and then go home and, and channel that into, into their work, which is awesome. Um, I've, I've never been able to do that cause I just can't calm my thoughts and focus on, on something creative. That's, that's kind of, operating on different, you know, emotion, emotional levels. Um, so I need to really feel kind of loving, <laughs> warm vibe and energy to, to, uh, be in the space to, to get anything really down at all. Um, yeah, I hear, I hear that a lot, I you know, that, and I'm, that people find time that in fact, they, yeah, they, they cherish their time more, um, yeah, it's more and, precious, and yeah. and I, I I find yeah, it's it's definitely more precious, and I find like even you know during during the day, uh, out and about doing things, it's you know you might find something or hear something that that you know is is a another footnote, and I'll, I'll make a note on my phone about it, and you know so I I think if you kind of all, all I think about <laughs> all day is just my family and music. And that's it really. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't have any other side interests. I don't like, I, I, I like to read, you know, not like I don't like books or anything, but, or films I like to watch movies when we have a chance and things like that. But there's no other like noise or nonsense, like uh, gambling or like any kind of, you know, I don't know whatever people, people might do. That's really like all I'm thinking about. And, and, and the only things I care about. So, right, right, right. Uh, um, and then they often intertwine. So then it's, it's been very lucky in that sense that, you know, I've been able to spend so much time day to day with family and then be, have such immediate access to music too, where I you know I have my studio in, in our house. I don't need to, physically go to another place when I have time to, to make music or anything. I like that. I could just immediately just go here and then go back, you know, and here and back and just, it's, it's always chipping away right, uh, right. When, it, when, it, when it's making things. I, I, I do feel pressure kind of every day 
and I felt this for a few years more than than earlier, where I feel like time is slipping away, sure. and I need and I need to make the most of what is available right now, or I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna have the chance later. And I always like to have something done every day, um, any kind of small progression. You know, even if it's just like, okay, this one, one track that I'm working on, like, let me fix the EQ on this, this drum part. Okay. That was something that I did today, you know, and just mentally kind of check, check that off the list kind of thing. But when it, when I get nothing done, if that, if that happens, I start to feel kind of, uh, itchy, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I get, uh, so I just getting like something productive done is is really, really important to me. Um, and it wasn't for a long time. And I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't because it, it's become such a routine, like ritual thing where uh, I've, I've gotten into kind of patterns and want to make sure that I get all of these things done in a day or else the day was kind of wasted, you know? Right. No, no, that's um, complete sense. You know, but, um, yeah, I think, how how people manage family and creative work is is obviously super subjective and very dependent on work availability and and family needs and you know so many things so you have to be thankful for everything uh you can't you can't kind of force the time you know you have to kind of just roll with how how the day goes and then and then uh kind of seize the opportunities when they when they come up uh, were you concerned before you had children that you would lose the the time or the focus to make art i don't think as much really no i mean it's kind of like at the time when uh when our first daughter was born and she's 12 now she's you know it was i was working a different job and I had a lot of time off during the year with that job. So I, I wasn't that concerned with it, I guess at the time. Um, and I never really felt that but just because I always knew that I would do it anyway. And that if I didn't, right. if I wasn't working on music after an extended period of time, I'd just feel anxious and depressed. And I, you know, it's like something I just need to do and have, have needed to do for a long time. Um, so is that, I, I is never, that true since you were a child? No, 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 no. I think I think that from maybe when I was twenty five oh, or okay. so, twenty 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 four, twenty five. I think something changed a little bit, but even at that point, it was it was less so. Um, I think I was still like easier to be distracted by nonsense and like not really focus as hard as I should have been on studying kind of like proper mixing techniques and engineering and kind of, you know, learning different things to, to help kind of creative processes later, you know, you kind of, um, just to sidestep for a second, I like not like reading manuals for things or like really explicitly learning how anything works and just trying to get a sound out of something to, to mm -hmm. make music. Um, but a lot of times it's necessary to, 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 you know, kind of, you have to, you have to kind of have certain parameters in place, you know, for things to sound at some level properly, quote unquote proper. Um, and I, I feel like I should have done that earlier and then I would have been on a, maybe better path earlier and then I would be in a higher state now, <laughs> you know, if that, if there's any regrets, uh, mm, to, to process, you know, well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I do think I mean, you need to acquire sharp technical skill to engage in obfuscation and oblique making. Like you need the fundamentals before you know how to muddy the water. Uh -huh. You know, I, uh, I think that's such a, good and difficult question and i i feel like you maybe need to know what the rules are first to bend and break them but also 
undoubtedly through history in all all media and and, and forms of of art i think people have had no conception of what the rules were and made incredible work you know um yeah like kind of so un goes, unconscious i, I yeah. feel that 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 may be true but it's less likely they were able to repeat that process yeah. maybe i not sure i think so. I, I i think i i agree you know where maybe some people just had that intuitiveness to begin with and just had this raw emotion and and take uh, and we're able to translate it where it, it sounded groundbreaking. It's like, w this is just some next level evolution. Um, but then maybe then they realized, oh, actually, I, I was doing this wrong. I need to do it like this. And then it's later, later work is a little watered down feeling or less, you know. So there's, I think you need to temper when you hold up the, the rule and when you throw it out the window, you know, and, and yeah, yeah. that, that just comes with practice and time, I think. And then just your own taste too. Um, and I'm still, I know I, I love learning new ways to cut and just so many things just by accident too, you know, and just going through and then talking to other people who are making music about how they were able to get a certain sound. And a lot of people are, you know, with, how how the you know people are explaining things and being very transparent with process more and everything i think is excellent and it's you know uh how like eight how accessible and, and great ableton is for like anybody to just kind of just start making music is incredible um and it's easy for people to make like very similar sounding stuff and some people are totally happy and fine with that. Not everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel or or be uh, kind of making very salient sounding, you know, insane stuff. Um, and it's just everybody has their own reasons for making music or art in, in, in any any form. Um, but I think having uh, just again that connection with what is it that you are trying to say is the most important and then how that gets translated not it's not really about the sound i think it's very and one thing i think that has changed in in my perspective too um over the years is kind of like being initially kind of uh taken aback kind of or just kind of like with the flashiness of how something sounds with how something was produced or the, the actual sonics of what you're hearing. Um, and then not really paying attention to what is this actually saying to me or what is this making me feel? Um, and there's and to a lot clar of clarify, there's no words in your music, right? Uh, recently I've been using my own vocals pretty much on every track oh, yeah? that, that I've released. Yeah. Yeah. Was They're that true? Very... Was that true before? Uh, no, no. no. So I okay. think that was a shift around like 2018 okay. we did like i did like a kind of mini lp um called decades tempest on, on the on discotopia that uh, where i just started using my own vocals more mm -hmm. and i kind of got to the point where i didn't feel comfortable sampling uh other vocal even if they were kind of edited and and you know uh, and change so you could you know you know it wasn't that obvious what it, what it was or who it was and this and that just gotcha. you know i didn't i didn't want to be doing that anymore for a number of reasons and then just it felt like that was the next step that i wanted to take with stuff that i was making and felt that's what it made it made sound like uh i was completing things was by adding that kind of vocal element mm -hmm. and that's that's what i'm trying to improve the most now i think i've um maybe made some strides <laughs> some small baby steps in the past couple of years but um yeah it's and it, again it depends on like what that particular track i hopefully think in the right right choice what it needs and how much of this or how much of this or how much of that um but yeah kind of going forward i i feel like i have a little better 
understanding of uh, personally, like how much is too much and how much is just enough where it's so easy to just add infinite tracks and that, you know, it just becomes overproduced that over, over or underproduced. Then where's that like perfect middle ground. And I feel like just for, for my own work, I'm getting a better grip on where that, that, uh, you know, kind of sweet spot is, Mm -hmm. um, which is exciting. And I, I was, I think, I don't know. I can't really say specifically a time, but definitely in the past, I was, I had a harder time kind of getting a clear idea of what it was I wanted to do, where then I was just making noise and saying, oh, right, that's something. And let me like finish it, you know, Um, whereas now I have a much clearer understanding of the kinds of things I want to hear and the things I want to challenge myself to make where now I have kind of too many ideas and not enough time to finish all of them. I have, you know, like, I don't know how many different projects that have started and are at different percents of being complete, you know, but that's fun too. Cause then you can kind of just on different days, kind of head back to, to these different points and, and save points and, you know, hopefully kind of uh, pick it up and, and continue to, to a place where you're happy with, um, for sure. I think that's always necessary yeah. to have multiple projects that feed into each other. Yeah. It's just a, it's very rare. I find that an artist works on one thing from zero to a hundred percent. It's always mm-hmm. kind of ping ponging back and forth. Yeah. I think, I think you need to kind of let those, those tangents kind of run free and, and let them kind of go off into their own thing you know, where you, maybe it started from, from this point. And then you might think, oh, this is kind of veering off into some other territory, but I'll just, let me just clip that and get back on track. I think it's important to, to see those tangents through, you know, and then you might end up actually in a better place than, than where you started. Um, Yeah. I think of it as plants. Some, some plants you water every day, uh some you water once a month. Mm-hmm. And I always imagine different projects as, you know, succulents, et cetera. And, yeah, and yeah. they need different types of attention. Yes, I agree. Well, so if someone wanted to start listening to one Discotopia, but to two BD1982, uh-huh. what would you recommend? Um, I think I might recommend the the newest and final album, Amaranthine. I think that that kind of encapsulates a lot of what, where I had started and kind of like where this point, to where this point has gotten, and then also what's kind of coming in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of... ideas and kind of um, potential directions, potentialities Mm -hmm. to be found in there. Um, Okay. Other, other discotopia releases, I think uh, Matt's album from this past year loss is incredible. That's, I think he's, he's another artist who's always like kind of one upping. I don't, I'm not saying that that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm striving for. But <laughs> I think he's been he's been consistently uh, one upping his his work, and his his latest is definitely his best. And he's also kind of started incorporating his own vocals and uh, collaborations with with other artists. One one vocalist in Japan, uh, Chocola B, in particular, he's he's done some really great kind of um, '90s Bristol you know, massive attacky kind of, uh, sounding stuff with her. Um, and that would be a, a good footnote to check for, for Matt's work. All right. Um, also the seekers international stuff that we did, the two, two records with them was, are, are some of my favorites. Uh, Wally Badaro, who is, you know, very famous, 
a prolific keyboard player uh, from France who's worked with Grace Jones and Mick Jagger. Uh, we did a, an EP with him, which was a good fever dream kind of come true, where Matt, Matt had sent him an email in 2011, uh, almost just as a, as a lark, saying, hey, we just started a label. Would you like to release with us? And he, re he res responded to the email uh, seven years later. <laughs> saying, does, this, does this offer still stand? And we kind of like almost fainted when we <laughs> kind of got this, got this news and how that worked out. I still don't know. And it's, it's incredible. You know, he's legendary, legendary player and artist. And that was so uh, a very high, high watermark for both of us. Um, we were kind of, when we were starting out the label, we were both independently kind of finding uh, his, his, album echoes wally's album echoes from i think 1980 or 81 and we kind of matt and i are both like have you ever heard of wally butterall and this this album like, yeah yeah i just started listening to it. it was just very weird coincidence and then you know matt was like i'll send him an email I'm like yeah 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 do that <laughs> just uh, let's see what happens and then it actually came into fruition to be something was was crazy um nice i mean i think <laughs> That should be a message to all listeners that they should send out Lark emails because a lot of yes. a lot of the craziest stuff I've had happen is just expressing support or offering opportunity to someone um, with no hope or expectation of it returning to me. You know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you have to lose? You know, you really like this. There's, there's maybe some some uh humility or something exactly. but like yes. you have to let go of that there's 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 no time for that in the kind of world that this is <laughs> you know as you as you go on as you spend more time here and and figure out how things actually work there's there's no time for for uh feeling embarrassed about anything no. that you're gonna do all right well i gotta go screen uh, the nightmare before christmas oh that's awesome <laughs> I'll let you get back to your morning. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Peace. Later. Music by Dory Bavarsky and Ming Chen. Next up, we have Samuel Hayes. Right.